Um, I'd like to turn it over to Megan and I guess welcome her to uh, the Western New York chapter of Trout Unlimited. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe, for that introduction and, and Bill for getting us started with our technology. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for showing up tonight and, and giving me time to share a status update on Bristol Bay and the proposed Pebble Mine. Uh, before we, we dive into all the, the good stuff I have for this group, I would love it if you have either been to Bristol Bay or Alaska, if you could chat it in. I just like to kind of have an idea of who uh, I'm talking to and if folks have had the opportunity to come and visit this incredible place. So um, like I said, if you, if you have visited Bristol Bay or Fish Alaska, please put it in the chat. But uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, walk us through uh, a little bit of, of, take us through the backstory of why Trout Limited has invested a ton of resources and time into Bristol Bay. And then I'm going to make sure I mean, some of you are probably are probably well versed in what's going on with Pebble, but some might be um, new to this issue and, and new to where things stand now. And so I am going to walk us through hopefully a, a um, quick timeline of, of what's happened over the last nearly two decades that we have been working on this issue. And then I will share a little bit of, of where we're at right now. And then I'll make sure that I leave you with how you can get involved or how you can help in our new chapter for Bristol Bay. So before we dive into all of that, oh, and like it was said, I will absolutely be answering questions. Um, I'll, I'll leave a pause in the middle for it, but then also I have plenty of time at the end and I'll stick around and answer as many questions as y'all have. So with that, um, before we dive into all of that stuff, I do want to share a little bit about um, Trout Unlimited's Alaska program and where I'm coming from. So uh, like it was said, I'm, I'm talking to you today from traditional um, Dena'ina lands, uh, otherwise known as Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, we have um, about nine staff members who work for Trout Unlimited, both in Anchorage and Juneau. Uh, and we work on a couple of different key areas that all come back to the Trout Unlimited mission of keeping our streams clean, cold, and fishable. And so the work that we do in Bristol Bay is primarily to, to protect that um, incredible uh, fish habitat and, and clean water that exists in this region and then continues to make Bristol Bay one of the, the true banner uh, fisheries that we have left in the Pacific Northwest, but arguably left on the planet. And just a little bit about myself so you kind of understand how I came into this, this fight. Uh, I grew up in Colorado actually and came up to Alaska for what was supposed to be just a, a fun summer working in Glacier Bay National Park when I was in college. And uh, I was going to school for environmental policy. My, my ultimate goal was to go work in Washington, DC on the Hill. Um, but when I came to Alaska, that plan got flipped on its head and I, I knew that this is the place that I, I wanted to be. And so when I finished school, I came up and worked for the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in Homer at the end of the Kenai Peninsula. And I did that for about a year before I took the job with Trout Unlimited. And I've been with TU in Anchorage um, as the Bristol Bay organizer for um, three years next month. So uh, I'm really grateful to work on this issue uh, and really grateful for our Trout Unlimited Alaska team. We're small but mighty. And um, I'm excited to share some of the good work that we've done with alongside so many of our, our supporters across the country. And so kind of how I, I came into this fight, there was a huge uh, need that was, at, that was seen about a couple of years ago um, when the proposed pebble mine was looking like it was going to get its key federal permit. And so TU identified the need for a little bit more capacity to help with organizing around a public comment period uh, on an issue that hunters and anglers have and, and trout limited members have been weighing in on for, for nearly two year, or 20 years. And so um, TU has been involved from, from the beginning. We've stood um, alongside and behind the local people of Bristol Bay who have been adamant about um, what they want for their local lands and waters. And um, to this day, we are, are working with those partners um, to make sure that the proposed pebble mine um, does not come back now uh, and that we have permanent protections for the Bristol Bay region. And so again, some of you, uh, I imagine, let's see if we had any responses in the chat from folks. So I've not seen anyone um, who has uh, come to Bristol Bay or has fished Alaska. Um, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm not seeing that. Um, yeah, uh, I don't see any, any responses yet in there. I probably should have put myself in there, but, but, uh, okay, but well, no, yeah, nobody's so, done yet. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, great. Then I get to paint a really cool picture for you of exactly what, what we value and what Bristol Bay is like. And so this picture I think is a really great start. And we're talking about a, a place that has um, gin clear rivers that run absolutely red in the summertime with sockeye salmon. This is wild salmon country and um, Bristol Bay really is a place like none other when it comes to um, wild fish and wild trout. Um, not only are our fish just the, 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 the iconic animal or, or piece of wildlife that you see in this region, but really Bristol Bay is uh, a, a region that is untouched by development. We're talking hundreds of miles of um, open landscape, no fences, no roads, no buildings. Um, and it really just is one of the most wild places that you um, might ever have the opportunity of visiting and fishing someday. So, um, you know, when we, we zoom in and we talk specifically about Bristol Bay, I do want to just give us a moment to kind of zoom out and, and understand how Bristol Bay fits in to the rest of the wild Bye. Pacific salmon uh, population. Think about Bristol Bay, Alaska. Um, and so if we are looking at Bristol Bay, we look at the Pacific Northwest, uh, we look at other places that have historically been known for having really strong um, salmon, salmon runs. We look at places like Oregon and California and Washington. And what this map um, that you can see on your screen hopefully shows you is that right now there's really low numbers and diversity of, of wild Pacific salmon. And every single one of those red dots you see represents a hatchery. And so uh, as you, you go further north, you start to see a little bit more blue representative of more moderate uh, abundance and diversity of fish. Uh, you see some less or smaller concentration of those hatcheries. Uh, and as you continue moving further north into uh, south, Southeast Alaska, South Central Alaska, all the way around the Alaska Peninsula and in the Bay, you notice that really dark, uh, that deep dark uh, sw swath of blue, which is abundant salmon, diverse species, and you don't see any ha any hatcheries, any of those red dots. And so what Bristol Bay is, is that it's the, the last remaining wild salmon uh, uh, population uh, that we have in this region. And so much of that can always be pointed back to the fact that the region has intact headwaters. Uh, the, the clean water and healthy fish habitat is, is truly a testament to the, the power of this region and how um, salmon can continue to thrive as long as we protect uh, and, and maintain their, their habitat that they come back to um, uh, each cycle to, to spawn. So that's Bristol Bay in context with the rest of the Pacific Northwest. But when we do dive in uh, to the region and look at just how much of a powerhouse this place is, uh, it's, it's important to note some of, of uh, these numbers. So in 2021, this past summer, uh, the region broke the all time record with, actually I need to update this number, but it was over 70 million sockeye uh, that swam through uh, and returned to the region um, this season. And that was just a, a huge moment of celebration, uh, especially given the fact that a lot of the fisheries, even in Alaska, uh, across the state are, are declining. So Bristol Bay continues to be a, a place and a region that is um, supporting just huge numbers of, of sockeye salmon. And Bristol Bay is the, or produces over or nearly 50% of the global abundance of sockeye salmon. So not only is it important regionally and in our state, but also um, the, the uh, largest, the uh, single largest um, place where uh, sockeye are being produced is, is Bristol Bay. And sockeye, like I said, are, are the, the banner species, but the region also is one of the largest producers of king salmon on the planet. And king salmon are definitely struggling um, more than any of the other species, particularly in Alaska. So again, Bristol Bay remains a really special place for this fishery um, that is absolutely worthy of, of protection. And so uh, for maybe for many of you, what, what um, brought you to this presentation is the fact that Bristol Bay, along with the salmon, is also uh, home to uh, just prolific um, and trophy um, trout species, uh, including rainbow trout, arctic char, um, Dolly Varden, Arctic Grayling, the list goes on, but really this place, uh, again, continues to rain for fish just because of that, that clean water and healthy habitat that um, is always present. And while we talk about the fish, obviously Trout Unlimited, we're very engaged here, um, but we also know that, that the salmon uh, support and make up uh, an entire ecosystem and support everything from the smallest microorganisms in the stream bed, all the way up to the massive brown bear that are 
arguably, if, if not even more iconic than the salmon themselves. And so again, this place ecologically just is, is really like none other. And so while we have this, this incredible ecosystem that exists in Bristol Bay, as it has for, for thousands and thousands of years, there's also been uh, three primary human communities that have developed around the fishery and that uh, continue to thrive because of the fish that come back every single year. And so I'm gonna just take a minute to talk through some of those. Uh, so the, the first community we'll, we'll talk about ourselves. It's the huge recreational and sport uh, fishery that exists in the region and has for uh, nearly a hundred years. And so um, about 40,000 trips are, are take, our fishing, recreational fishing trips are taken um, every single year, and about 13,000 of those anglers are coming from out of state. So uh, contributing to a, a huge tourism economy in the region that is worth about $160 million and provides uh, over 1,000 full-time and part-time jobs. And that's everyone from your uh, guides, your pilots, your lodge workers, the list goes on. But the recreational fishery in this region is, is truly um, incredible, and it's a really wonderful community that um, I've been grateful to have been let in on a little bit and just really um, is such a huge part of the communities in the region. And then alongside the, the recreational fishery, we also have a massive commercial fishery in Bristol Bay. And uh, when we talk massive, we're talking one and a half billion dollars every single year that is supporting 14,000 jobs. Uh, those are your commercial fishermen, your tender operators, your fish processors, uh, and the list goes on, uh, making, and all of these jobs are making up about 75% of the local employment and some of the small hubs like, uh, Dillingham and King Salmon. Uh, and it's definitely also, I would, I would just anecdotally add uh, very much a cultural thing as someone who's lived in a, a commercial fishing town in Alaska. It is so exciting. Um, there's a huge buzz around town when people are getting their boats ready to put in the water and, uh, are ready to, um, feed feed the rest of the country some of the the most healthy and, and wild sockeye salmon that that we have on this planet still so very very special um, but but a huge component of the culture and the regional economy in Bristol Bay and last but certainly not least um, there is a very strong tradition of subsistence in in the Bristol Bay region with nearly eight thousand Alaska Native people of uh, Yupik Alutic and Athabascan descent. Um, who continue to live a fully um, subsistence hunting and fishing uh, lifestyle in the region. And so when we talk about uh, potentially a, a change in a food source, we're talking about um, really having uh, really strong issues of, of food security and food insecurity um, in places that don't have access to a grocery store or affordable food. Uh, Bristol Bay is fully off of the road system, which means you cannot drive there. Uh, you cannot, the only way you can get to Bristol Bay uh, is by flying or boating in or, or taking the ferry or a barge. And so um, the food that people are hunting and fishing for is what is going to feed their family for, for the rest of the year. And that is something that is very unique to this region. Um, and that makes it really um, special, but also adds another level of importance to um, protecting the, the resource. And so while we have, uh, while we have this, these communities and this incredible ecosystem that is built around the salmon, uh, of course, and what we are talking about primarily today is a proposal and a proposed mine that, that threatens all of this. And so that is the proposed pebble mine. Um, the pebble deposit is a um, a low-grade uh, hard rock uh, deposit of copper, primarily copper and gold, um, that is located in the headwaters of Bristol Bay. So about 20 miles north of Lake Iliamna, um, the pebble deposit was discovered in the in the late 80s um, and is expected and or suspected to have roughly $600 billion worth of copper and gold in the ground. And so, as you can probably tell from that, very strong incentive for mining companies to to extract and to develop uh, a mine and, and develop the deposit here. Um, over the course of the, the last 20 years, and what we'll talk about in just a minute is very strong um, desire to um, get in there and build the infrastructure pr primarily to facilitate our large scale mine. Uh, when we talk about Pebble, we, we talk a lot about the mine itself, but again, we have to realize that this place is largely undeveloped. There are no roads, there's no uh, uh, um, energy infrastructure, and all of that would also need to be established in order for a mine like Pebble to, to exist. And so 
Um, I, I apologize if this map is a little blurry. I, I didn't think it would show up like this, but again, just to, to emphasize the fact that um, the mine itself has always been a, a massive concern. Again, we're talking about an open pit copper and gold mine um, in an incredibly wet area where, where wastewater and mine waste management would be um, a, a massive excuse me, a massive challenge, but also Pebble would have to build uh, over one, a 100 mile long um, single use private road. Um, that road would connect to a deep water port that would have to be um, built about a mile into the Cook Inlet. And then some of the other transport or other uh, infrastructure that would be needed would be a 100 mile long um, natural gas pipeline, which would transport energy from the Kenai Peninsula to the mine site, uh, as well as um, uh, other um, sources of energy that would be developed on site um, at, at the mine. And so what uh, one of the biggest questions that I get is, is how do Alaskans feel about this? It's confusing because Alaska some, or it can be confusing because Alaska is very much a pro-development state and we've built our, our state economy on oil and gas and natural resource extraction. And I think that re reigns true um, still to this day, absolutely. But uh, what people in Bristol Bay and Alaskans um, have been saying for years is that we're not, we're not opposed to mining, but we are opposed to a mine in this place. And um, if, if we want to get into the statistics of it, uh, consistently Alaskans statewide are opposed to the mine at a rate of about 60%. When you go into Bristol Bay communities, uh, that level of opposition to uh, a proposed pebble mine goes up to about 80% opposed. So Alaskans from, from day one, since this mine has been talked about and, and proposed, have been overwhelmingly uh, against a mine um, threatening the, the salmon in this region. Um, so before I get into the timeline of the, of the pebble mine fight, I just wanna provide a space for questions if there are any way, if there are any of them. Um, let's see, it looks like, is there any way to mine ecologically cleanly? Um, at this point, no. So um, right now, the technology that exists, there is no way to um, do hard rock open pit mining without having um, basically mine waste runoff or waste water. And that is the biggest problem with, with Pebble and ultimately what, what um, I'll get to that in a second, but ultimately what stopped them from being able to operate. So there's no way to get rid of mine waste in a way that wouldn't have an impact on the fishery. And that's been made, um, that's been, that's been um, scientifically proven by, um, by it's been three times peer reviewed and, and that science is, is quite firm on the fact that mining of this type in this space would have a negative impact on the fishery. And it does look like Megan, there was one other question that came in, actually two other, as we're kind of saying, one uh, was what months do you fly fish the salmon in the Bay Area, and another one was uh, who benefits from from the mining. So I don't know if you want to tackle those sure. two before we get on to the next section. Yeah. So uh, the the summer season is the short and and fast and furious season for fly fishing um, salmon in the region. So I would say late May. I think the opener is like the first week of June, and then you can fish up until. Um, we, I went out there and um, I was there in August, but I know that people were still fishing into mid and late September. So um, pretty, pretty fast, but everything's frozen out there right now. So definitely um, a lot of the lodges and operations board up for the winter time. Um, but still, it's, it's, uh, it's the same for commercial fishing, too. It's a very short, like a six week long season um, in the in the summer. And it is how a lot of people make make their money and then either don't work or they go and do a different seasonal job. Um, that's very much common in Alaska. And then Brian asked, um, who will benefit from the mining? Um, you know, to be to be frank, the the company that has been uh, trying to develop the Pebble Deposit for many many years, the Pebble Limited Partnership, they are the entity that would benefit the most from mining. Um, it is absolutely a um, get rich quick uh, uh, type of proposal based on what we have seen, what they have presented to local communities. Um, the jobs that have been offered, about one to 2,000 jobs that have been promised over the lifespan of a 20-year-long mine um, are not guaranteed to go to local people, and many of them would be highly skilled, so they'd have to bring people in either from uh, out of state or uh, likely out of the country. Um, also, Pebble Limited Partnership uh, is, a, is a Canadian mining company. Northern Dynasty Minerals is their parent company. They're headquartered in, in um, Vancouver, 
um, BC. And so when it comes to the jobs and the economics that are, are promised, um, it's very, uh, it, it's not very clear on how much would actually benefit local people, especially when there would be a uh, nearly guaranteed um, negative loss because of um, the fish that would be in the fish habitat that would be lost from mining. But great questions. Thank you. Yeah, that looks okay, like that's it for now. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to go into talking about timeline a little bit so we can kind of understand how we got to where we are now. So uh, like I said, Trout Noted has been involved in this fight for a very long time, um, but officially uh, we became involved in 2010 after the Pebble Limited Partnership had been going to a bunch of communities and making promises for uh, a, a mega mine that was going to bring a lot of economic prosperity to the region. And we wanted to know alongside the tribes and the commercial um, fishing groups, we wanted to know exactly what the risk of a mega mine would be to um, the, the fishery and the habitat of the region. So in 2010, we called on the EPA to conduct a Clean Water Act assessment. And so over the course of the next three years, the EPA came in and they conducted that assessment and it uh, completed and it conclu concluded with the Bristol Bay Watershed Assessment. Um, that the conclusion of that assessment was that any mine of any size in the Bristol Bay region would have a negative and permanent impact on the productivity of the Bristol Bay fishery. And it's important to note here that as part of this, this process that's outlined by the Clean Water Act, uh, it, it calls for public comment. And so over a million people from Bristol Bay, as well as across the country who know the, the benefits and the value of the fishery all came out and said they do not want a proposal that, uh, or do not want a mine that could potentially um, harm the fishery and that maintaining the fishery was the, the biggest priority. And so after that watershed assessment was completed, there were cascading impacts for the Pebble Limited Partnership. And so Anglo-American, which was another mining company who had, who was an investor in the project, they walked away from, from their financial stake in the partnership. They were followed by Rio Tinto, who also walked away and said that they didn't want to be involved in a, in a project that had this much public opposition and that was um, this detrimental to the local, commu local communities. And that was bookended by the EPA releasing the proposed determination for Bristol Bay. The proposed determination basically said that uh, mining, if it were to uh, happen in the, in the pebble deposit region, would have to be so small so that it had an acceptable amount of adverse impacts. Basically, it would have to keep their, their project impact so small that um, it wouldn't impact um, fish and wildlife in a way that would have a, a negative impact on the communities that depend on them. And so, again, when that proposed determination was released, over a million and a half people uh, commented supporting the proposed determination, um, saying that they wanted to make sure that the um, the the proposal or the proposed determination um, would protect the region. And so, um, when this is normally where a lot of people ask me, like, why are we still talking about the pebble mine? I thought that it died in 2014. And really, this proposed determination um, it set the region up to to have some strong protections in place, but it actually never finalized those protections. And the Pebble Limited Partnership sued the EPA. They said that. They had preemptively um, vetoed their project before they even had the opportunity to, to an apply for a permit. But really, they were just in a um, unfavorable political window, and they had just lost um, two of their, their major um, investors in the project. And so we saw Pebble go quiet, but, but not go away altogether. And really, they were just regrouping until um, they got a better political window to jump through them. Uh, they found that with the election of President Trump in 2016 and 2017, and by December 2017, Pebble filed for their key federal permit um, through the Army Corps of Engineers. This key permit was, is, a, is a huge part of being able to operate in the region. It's their Clean Water Act 404 permit. It's basically what would allow them to dig a massive hole in the ground and then release wastewater into um, waters of the United States in Bristol Bay. And so... Uh, after we saw that that um, permit filed for, we also saw a very fast um, permit process be laid, permit review process being laid out by the Army Corps of Engineers. And so right away, the, the Corps began their scoping period. So they went to 
uh, all of the different Bristol Bay communities and, uh, and then Seattle, Anchorage and Seattle and in Washington, D.C. And they said, what should we focus on when we consider this, this Pebble permit? Uh, and 400,000 people again commented that uh, we, this permit shouldn't be considered at all and that it, it uh, would not be um, it would not be compatible with with the fishery. And so um, despite all that public comment and public input, uh, they continued and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers released the draft environmental impact statement uh, and then opened a comment period in January of 2019. Again, 685,000 supporters came out and commented on this draft EIS. Um, this document is supposed to account for all of the potential risks that a project like Pebble could bring to um, the existing economies, the environment, and the cultural resources of the area. And so again, we overwhelmingly saw that people in the region and beyond did not want a project um, that was going to have negative harm on, on any of these things. Um, while, so after that comment period closed, uh, we were waiting, basically the Army Corps of Engineers was going to go back and uh, incorporate all of those comments uh, into what would be the final draft environmental impact statement. But what, when we saw the writing on the wall, we knew that the Army Corps of Engineers was barreling towards issuing Pebble this really important permit. And so we decided uh, in the spring of, of last year that we um, were going to go directly to the White House and try and do everything in our power to get this permit to be denied. And so in spring of 2020, Trout Unlimited launched a petition specifically to President Trump um, being very clear about why this place um, absolutely needed um, uh, needed to be stopped from, from the proposed pebble mine. And uh, I will say that we had a, a very unique group of, of supporters that joined, uh, joined the masses of sportsmen and women across the country. Some of those maybe non-traditional um, conservation allies um, included Donald Trump Jr., who, as you can see from some of these tweets from last summer, uh, were very clear in their opposition to Pebble. And then um, Nick Ayers as well is, was the former chief of staff for Vice President Pence. And so um, what this really did was elevate the issue of Pebble to the media in a way that we had not seen before. And then even um, we were even getting segments on, on Fox News, um, having Bass Pro Shop CEO and a local lodge owner, Brian Kraft, um, were given two separate segments uh, and, and a huge platform to um, make it very clear that the, the effort to stop Pebble um, was bipartisan and that it was something that Americans, no matter on what else you agree or don't agree, dis don't agree on, um, could come together and, and be united on here. And so um, we call that like the summer of craziness because every day it seemed like there were new people coming out from every side of the political spectrum who wanted to help and make sure that Pebble's permit was was denied. And in the middle of that, the final environmental impact statement was released by the Army Corps. And what we saw again was it was a document that really failed to um, in, in, encapsulate and uh, uh, outline all of the potential risks that a mine like Pebble could bring to the Bristol Bay region. So we were still very, very concerned, um, but continued um, to, to raise our voices and, and collectively advocate against Pebble. And that message was was heard very much so. So on in August of 2020, the Army Corps um, said that Pebbles, uh, per, the Pebble project, um, would not be able to meet the mitigation standards that are outlined by the Clean Water Act. Um, that's something that we had been saying for, for uh, the entire length of the permit review process, but it was incredibly telling that the tide had turned and that the Army Corps was finally listening to what thousands of people across the country had been saying that um, bottom line, pe the proposed pebble mine was unable to meet Clean Water Act standards and shouldn't be, be permitted. And so um, what's also significant about that announcement from the Army Corps was this was the first time that we found support in our elected officials in the Senate. So Senator Lisa Murkowski and Senator Dan Sullivan have always stood on the sidelines of this issue, despite Alaskans being very vocal about being opposed to it. They've stood firm in saying, you know, we, we want to make sure that Pebble has the opportunity to go through the permit review process just as any other extraction uh, a, a proposal would. But when the Army Corps announced that Pebble was unable to meet Clean Water Act standards, both senators um, for the first time came out and said that they did not think that Pebble should get its permit. Clearly, it was is unable to meet 
the important standards uh, laid out um, by, by the permit review process. And so uh, a year ago, last Thursday, um, we celebrated the one-year anniversary of the Army Corps of Engineers officially denying the permit for the proposed Pebble Mine. Again, they cited that Pebble was unable to meet um, Clean Water Act standards. And it was interesting that they specifically noted that Pebble was, quote, contrary to public interest. Uh, a, a very um, subtle but real nod that the, the fact that so many people had been outspoken on this issue for so long were a huge component of, of why this mine was not, or this permit was not issued. Um, and just to kind of share of, of where things stand right after that, Pebble, of course, filed an appeal to the Army Corps of Engineers saying, you know, we want you to go back in and, and review our plans. And so that permit or that appeal process has been ongoing. Um, the Army Corps said that it would take about a year. So we're expecting um, come early 2022 that we will know if that permit um, denial is upheld or, or overturned. Um, our lawyers and our, our staff were following it, but honestly, we're not um, too concerned because the, the rationale that the Army Corps gave for the permit being de denied was, was pretty solid. And um, we're prepared if we need to, to, to argue uh, if the permit um, denial is overturned. But again, we feel pretty confident that the Army Corps will, will uphold their decision. So that was also, um, you know, when the permit was denied, so many people, um, you know, celebrated uh, and, and figured Pebble's dead. And uh, I think if, if you have not listened to anything else in this presentation, you should listen here. And it's very clear that Pebble is not fully dead yet, and we still have work to do. And so um, what we absolutely need right now is we need this permit denial to be upheld. Um, that's going to be the number one thing that we are, are looking forward to in, in 2022. But most importantly, we need to advance and, and achieve long-term community-supported protections for the Bristol Bay region. We do not want to be fighting the proposed pebble mine or another mine here in, in 5, 10, 20, 50 years. And so we need to put mechanisms in place to make sure that we don't have to keep fighting this fight. And so since the permit was denied, so really over the last year, we have been working really hard to identify what those two mechanisms, what those mechanisms, mechanisms for permanent protection might be. Uh, and we've narrowed it down to two. Uh, we're calling it our dual track approach um, that we need in order to officially check the box and say that Bristol Bay is safe. So um, the first part of, of permanent protections for Bristol Bay is that we need to make sure um, that Clean Water Act protections, um, again, the proposed prote protections that were first introduced in 2014, we need to finalize those protections. And that would offer a, a, a hedge of protection against specifically the Pebble Project. Um, I will note that Trout Unlimited, um, just a few weeks ago, we, um, we had sued the, the EPA back in 2019 um, for their decision to withdraw those protections. And we just found out that we actually won our lawsuit against EPA and th those protections would be put back on the table, um, which is really exciting and something we are very extremely happy about. Uh, and we've also had strong commitment from the Biden administration, EPA, to actually go through and finalize those protections. So Clean Water Act protections are on the horizon for Bristol Bay. Um, and again, that would offer a layer of of protection, but not the ultimate, uh, not the ultimate uh, nail in the coffin for for protecting this place. And so that leads us to our second need for permanent protection. And we are going to need congressional legislation to permanently retire the mineral leases in the Bristol Bay region. So um, the the land is currently on its state land that is designated for um, for mining. And so ultimately. Like I said, we are going to need to retire those leases. The way that happens is through both legislation in um, Congress as well as the state of Alaska. So those are the two main paths that we have looking forward. And it's going to be a very busy 2022 as we um, push forward bo both of those things. And um, while we're still looking at a couple of years of, of making sure that um, we have these mechanisms in place for Bristol Bay. The ball is absolutely rolling and, and our work is, is continuing to happen in this region. So uh, I, I wanna just um, share specifically about what you can do if you are um, compelled to help us in our new chapter of permanent protections for Bristol Bay. Um, one, while we don't have uh, legislation introduced just yet, when we do, it's going to be absolutely an all hands on deck 
uh, call for, for our members of Congress across the country to support this legislation and help us pass it. And so sending a message to your uh, elected officials is a is a great way to let them know that their constituents across the country in New York care about Bristol Bay. And you can do that by going all the, the link is on the next page. But if you go to our website, we have a really easy take action form um, that allows you to send that message. And the second thing you can do is connect with us online and stay tuned for our next call to action. Uh, if you can, you can get on our email list by contacting me. Again, my, my email will be on the next slide, but also if you are a social media user, uh, we're very active on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and that's a great way to get updates um, and take action when we have our next call. And then um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about it, especially because it's uh, Giving Tuesday today. Um, donating specifically to TU's effort in Bristol Bay is a really helpful way that you can help us be set up for success next year. And uh, we're doing a, a Fish It Forward challenge right now where every gift up to um, $200,000 will be matched dollar for dollar. So really great opportunity to um, give to a, um, a, a campaign specifically that um, has, has a has um, big tasks to do in the next year. Um, so that being said, uh, I've absolutely just scratched the surface on all things Bristol Bay, but I hope that um, my time, let's see, I'm not too far over, um, you have gotten a good idea of, of um, the history of, of Pebble and where TU has been involved and also um, where we go forward. And so savebristolbay.org is our website and a great place to get some more information and also to take action. Um, but I also offer myself as my email and I, I'm an open door, a digital open door, if you will. Um, if you have questions or, or have ideas for how we, um, you know, be effective in the next year, I'm all ears and I really love connecting with um, TU members and, and supporters across the country. So um, with that, I think I see some questions coming in, but um, thank you so much for, for your time and listening and for your support for this issue. But let's take a look at some of the questions we've got. Yeah. And Megan, it's up to you. First of all, thank you. This is a, an absolutely riveting uh, presentation. So uh, and a lot of questions uh, and comments have come in. Did you want me to read them out to you? I know you were kind of looking at them before, but I don't know if you can I see was, them as easy see. as I can. I can go through them if you'd like. Um, let me just make sure that I can see them. Let me just make sure that I can um, get to the top of them. I think, am I looking at David's question? Is that the top one? Yeah, it looks like I think uh, where we left off is when David asked about what issue, uh, why issue a permit to a Canadian owned company. That's kind of where we ah. left off. So if you, if Thank you can you. see it from there and you want to take them on your own, go, go ahead. Sure. Okay. So great question, David. Um, I could be a little bit more clear about who is behind the, the Pebble partnership. So um, Northern Dynasty Minerals is the Canadian company, um, and they are kind of the umbrella, and underneath is the, the Pebble Limited Partnership. And PLP is licensed um, in the U.S. They're headquartered based here in Anchorage, um, and so that's kind of how they get away with um, being considered an American company. But um, we have a strong history, and you know there are foreign um, mining companies that come into the U.S. and mine, as well as in the U.S., we go to other countries in mine as well. So um, there, and there were no other companies um, so far, there are no other companies who have an interest in developing in Bristol Bay um, because they see uh, how much public opposition there is because they see how hard it would be to mine in uh, a place like this. And so really Pebble Partnership is um, the, the entity that's trying to move forward with a mine that just really is not feasible in, in this area. Um, great question. Let's see. Um, oh no, sorry, I got a, Brian's question. Sorry. Okay. Um, what kind of mining is proposed, and what waste products would be deposited in the bay as a result? Um, so again, we're talking um, hard rock um, mining. So dig a big pit, um, and they're extracting low grade copper and gold ore. It would be processed on site, and so. Um, to basically extract the, the small amounts of copper and gold in, in that rock. Um, you use a lot of water to do that. And there are some, uh, excuse me, I, I don't know the exact processes that you would do to break down the rock and, and separate the, the waste rock from um, the, the ore itself, but it does involve a lot of water. And so then there would be a lot of wastewater. And so part of Pebble's plan is to manage, we're talking like 13 billion gallons of wastewater on site in a place that is 
Uh, it's all wetlands and it's incredibly um, like porous landscape. And so uh, the potential for either a, a dam break or a tailings uh, pond to fail, um, that water would be uh, basically released in the two biggest salmon bearing streams of the region that yes, they're upstream of Bristol Bay, um, but that all that water flows flows down and flows out. So that would be the kind of um, catastrophic damage that we would be seeing um, from problems with a mine in the headwaters of Bristol Bay. Um, another great question, let's see. Um, I think Chuck is next. Have you had any conversations um, with various groups opposed to open pit coal mining in the Upper Man River watershed in Alberta, Canada? Is it similar enough for, uh, for them to benefit from your lessons learned with Pebble? Um, that is not an issue that I'm super familiar with. So no, we have not had um, conversations with those groups, um, but I imagine that there are probably some of similar issues that exist, um, both when it comes to, um, well, this is coal mining. So that, that would be a little bit different, but if it's in the headwaters of a, of a main fishery, then um, ultimately, some of the same issues and, and risks would, would exist. Um, we work a lot of times with, um, I think like a similar issue that maybe is a little bit closer to you all is the boundary waters and some of the hard rock mining initiatives that have been uh, fought over for probably even longer than Bristol Bay up there. But uh, a lot of similarities just in terms of, um, you know, how, how do you value and maintain a resource, uh, one natural resource over the other, especially when you have strong um, fishing and hunting and, and sporting groups that are uh, are largely opposed to it and that would actually not really benefit the local communities as much as initially thought. Um, let's see, David asks who owns the property today? So uh, I believe I said it, but the state of Alaska uh, owns and leases um, the land that's the pebble deposit uh, and that um, those leases are set aside um, for mining. So um, again, this is why we're talking about having to ultimately pass legislation within the state of Alaska that would retire those leases. Um, that's a critical part of permanent protection for the region. If you don't mind me asking, um, sure. just because it kind of uh, piggybacks off of what you just, uh, how you answered that question was uh, one that I jotted down is you mentioned that legislation that is needed to kind of, kind of fully uh, put it down uh, permanently. What's the likelihood of that legislation being passed? Is that, um, what is, what is your sense for that? Well, you know, we were, uh, we were not super optimistic that the permit was going to get denied for Pebble, but we, <laughs> that happened. <laughs> um, and so we feel optimistic that the fact that we have support from um, both of our, our senators, as well as, you know, elected officials from um, like Washington, Oregon, California. Uh, Bristol Bay is absolutely a national treasure. It's not just an Alaska treasure. And so uh, we feel confident that with, you know, strong organizing and um, strategic um, lobbying here, frankly, that we can make it very clear that this is an issue that, that should be an easy um, thing for everyone to, to agree on and ultimately pass. We understand that some of the mechanisms and again, like why we're still waiting for legislation is Congress is kind of a mess. And so we kind of have to, to play that game as well and um, try and, and do what we can to work within the like the political nature of of where things are at right now. So that's kind of a, a long winded way of saying like we're confident, but it's going to be a challenge for sure. Yeah, I can imagine. But yeah, I'll let you pick it up and take a look at the rest of the ones Thanks. in the chat. Great question. We get a lot of people who are like, this is never going to happen. And we're like, well, we also said the same thing about the permit and that happened. So, you know, we, we walk forward optimistically, but uh, very aware of what our, our reality is. So yeah. thanks. Um, okay. David asked Rio Tinto backed out. They are no environmental heroes. So Bristol Bay must really be a bad ill-fated project. Uh, I, I think that's a really good indication of what, um, yeah, how this project is even viewed within the hard rock mining community and the natural resource extraction industry. We um, have so many people, including like former Pebble employees who uh, have, have come and said, you know, I support mining, I support uh, natural resource extraction, but this is the wrong project for the wrong place. So yeah, I, I think all of those are just good indications that this is never a project that was gonna go well in Bristol Bay. 
Let's see. Um, does the state next question from Joseph or Joe, does the state of Alaska have the legal authority to stop this or is it at the federal level only? Um, the state of Alaska does have uh, the opportunity to um, permanently protect the region. And again, uh, they would have to uh, retire the mineral leases for the region. And that happens through legislation. Uh, so again, when we talk about passing legislation, it will have to be uh, like parallel legislation, both in Congress as well as the state of Alaska um, to take those mineral leases off the table. Um, one unique challenge that we have um, currently and that we have been facing, gosh, for the last couple of years now is with our governor, uh, Mike Dunleavy. He has, um, from the get-go, been a strong supporter of the project and his uh, ties and connections to the Pebble Limited Partnership. If you if you have some time and want to deep dive, they're, they're pretty fascinating, but also uh, pretty uh, gross, gross negligence just to what his constituents and what Alaskans have been saying about this issue. So um, uh, he's definitely a, a challenge that we have actively been, been fighting and that we will have to overcome. He's up for re-election next year, so it will be interesting to kind of see how um, this may or may not play into it. But um, yeah, that's another challenge that we have within the state of Alaska. Um, let's see. Um, Jill said, excellent work. Thank you for, for folks who may believe there are too many enviro, environmental regs. It, um, do you feel it was citizen pressure that led to this outcome versus relying on existing environmental regs currently in place? Um, you know, I think it's a, that's an incredible question. Thank you for asking. I think it was a solid mix of both because, you know, you of course have the masses that are saying we don't want this mine. Um, but when you, you know, dig into those comments and you dig into uh, what, what Alaskans and what Americans across the country were really saying, it was that even if you, you know, were going to allow Pebble to happen, they don't even, make, they don't even meet the basic standards of the law that are required to operate legally in, in the state of Alaska. And so I think that was like, that is really the only way that the permit denial is upheld because uh, if it was really just citizen pressure or pressure from, you know, politicos, what Pebble would do is they would sue the Army Corps of Engineers to try and overturn the permit denial. And it, it would probably happen um, because there was no legal backing. So the environmental regs, um, basically like Clean Water Act requirements are crucial. And, and we would never get to this outcome if we didn't rely and didn't have those regulations in place. So I really do think it's it's really engaged citizens saying, if you look at the law, Pebble has no chance of happening and, and being permitted here. Um, but also that is uh, that is amplified by people who are holding microphones and being very clear that this mine is is not wanted in, in the region. So I, I really do feel like it's a mix of both. Let's see. Um, Joe asked, how much money has TU donated to the cause? Um, I, I, I don't want to have a dollar amount because that would go way beyond my time. Um, I've only been here for a couple of years. And like I said, TU has been involved in this for a long time, but um, TU is one of the leading organizations. So I wouldn't say that like we are donating money to the cause, but um, we have um, obviously been the beneficiary of so many incredible supporters, particularly in the, the sport fishing and, and hunting business community who have really rallied around us to, to say that, you know, we support protecting special places and Bristol Bay really is the, the most special of the special. Um, when it comes to, and maybe this was in reference to our, our fundraiser, um, our goal is about $200,000 um, because that's how much we have for our, our match. And we've um, raised about 150,000 of that so far. And all of that money is going to help us um, carry out the, the tactics that we're gonna need to do to get legislation introduced and over the finish line. Uh, as well as help make sure that Clean Water Act protections are finalized. And um, Brian, my most favorite question, thank you again. What can you do to make the biggest impact to assist you? I would say definitely go to savebristolbay.org and fill out that, um, that uh, the, the take action link, um, and then you will automatically be added to um, our emails. Uh, they come from me. I promise I don't send very many of them just when there are big updates, but taking action when, when I send you requests is really the most helpful thing. Um, letting our elected officials know that, that we care about this place and this issue is, is crucial. Um, and I'd say that's, that's probably the best thing you can do right now until we have 
um, legislation on the table or until we have um, a, a Clean Water Act protections that are further down along the process. But thank you, um, great, great question. Okay, that was that was a lot, but um, thank you for your questions and I'm happy to, to answer more of them if you have them. Any other comments too? I love obviously talking about Bristol Bay, so I'm happy to answer or um, go back and forth on other things as well. Yeah, what we'll do is we'll give some people a, a little more time to chat in any any questions. Um, I did have one actually. Um, obviously, the, the the focus is on uh, Bristol Bay and 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 keeping that at bay, if you will. But are there other proposed mines? in other sensitive areas that maybe aren't getting the, the, the frontline press that, that also, you know, TU is paying attention to, or, um, you know, that we wouldn't want to kind of, you know, uh, creep up while the, the focus is on such a big operation as, as Bristol Bay. Yeah. Do you mean, um, in the region or like out of Alaska? Uh, I guess maybe in the region also at, you know, in Alaska or any other sensitive areas. Yeah. I guess in, in, in Alaska, I know it's obviously a very large <laughs> place, but, um, just yeah. curious if there are other ones that, uh, um, are, uh, are in the works. Yeah. You know, I would say that, um, the Donlin mine is another one that, um, we don't have our, our fingers in, um, Donlin is, is uh, proposed to be in the Yukon Kuskokwim uh, region, which is just north of Bristol Bay. Um, and it did come up a little bit in the Pebble issue because some of the infrastructure that um, Pebble proposed would be built would actually likely connect to the Donlin mine. And that opens everything up to be, you know, to make the whole Southwest Alaska uh, an industrial mining district. And so there was a little bit of concern there, but the big difference um, between Donlin and Pebble is that people in the Donlin area actually want wanted the mine for a very long time. And so they had a lot of local support and buy-in um, and were also just a much more reputable company um, to be operating. And so um, from that, you know, there, there wasn't a huge need for TU to get involved. Uh, I think it goes back to, and why I like working on this issue is because we're not opposed to all mining. Um, just, you know, we don't support mining, irresponsible mining in, in, um, unique places like Bristol Bay. So that's one that we kind of like keep an eye on, but, but not really, um, are, are as concerned. We do quite a bit of work with transboundary mining in Southeast Alaska. So, there are a lot of mines that are in British Columbia um, that are upstream of, um, like if you know the like the Panhandle of Alaska, or um, yeah, the Panhandle of Alaska. Like um, there are mines that are in Canada um, that are uh, upstream of local Alaska communities, and so some of these mines that you know, if there's an issue, um, they are also uh, damaging habitat, um, salmon habitat that's important to the fisheries. Uh, both commercial, sport, and subsistence that are in um, the Southeast region. So TU does quite a bit of work um, on trans transboundary mining there. Um, and then, you know, I think it, it is, those are some of the biggest ones that we've been engaged on. And, and Bristol Bay continues to be like one of TU's biggest campaigns every single year. Um, and I, I think that just goes to the, the power um, of the region and just also like how bad of a mine proposal Pebble was. So not a, not a super full answer to your question. Um, but I think that as you know, TU wants to be intentional about, um, the development, um, projects that we oppose and it's obviously we don't oppose every single one. So, um, yeah, that's my answer. Yeah. There. Well, actually, no, that's fantastic. And, and given how large, uh, of a, of a task this must be to be dealing with Bristol Bay, I mean, it's clear that there's more going on that, you know, the general public doesn't necessarily know that you're also having to focus on, in mm -hmm. addition to that, or, or, or keep, uh, keep your eye on. So, uh, yeah. a, a lot of, a lot of work, uh, involved in that. Um, we did have another comment come in, uh, once is excellent presentation. They will definitely look into, uh, the information that you sent and hope to hear, uh, from you again later. Another comment says or question, uh, from Jill that says, have any CWA citizen suits been filed or, uh, being planned due to future uncertainty? So I would say no, um, mainly because I don't, you can't sue for a project that hasn't happened yet, or like you can't sue preemptively for damage that hasn't occurred. So as long as we don't have a mine being like happening, um, we're in a pretty good spot. 
Um, I do know though that that the tribes and local communities have been the key um, consultants to the Biden administration as they prepare to advance Clean Water Act protections. That's been a priority from the administration from day one. And so the tribes are pretty, um, the tribes are very um, well engaged as well as like local lodge owners and business owners that we work with as well. Um, again, particularly on the Clean Water Act protections. So does that answer the question? So. I, I believe so. I'll wait to see if there's another <laughs> follow-up question. Please feel free to offer follow-up if, if I wasn't yep, clear. Yep. Um, and I think the way you were reading some of the questions, Megan, I think some people might've been chatting them in to you individually as opposed oh. to everyone. So sometimes I noticed earlier you were reading one. I'm like, I don't see that one. So I oh. think that sometimes they have the choice to choose to do a direct message to somebody uh, as opposed to it going out to the whole group. So I don't know if you've seen any more come through. Um, I don't think so. I think I got most of them and again if i did not you guys can speak up and uh, or or comment that i didn't answer your question well well before i turn it back over to joe i want to say how much we we truly appreciate your time and uh for for tonight but also your time and effort involved in saving bristol bay this has been a fascinating program you know we obviously want to do our part to, to help you in this battle uh, certainly, I've taken some some notes on the links that you sent, and 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 I'll probably communicate with you afterwards. You know, we'll we'll get that information out through our channels, and certainly invite you to you know send further information either directly to me, and I can post it, or you can you know I give you our Facebook page, you can post uh, um, as often as you like. But you know, we certainly would want to be uh, as much a part of this effort. Uh, as we can. So um, but thank you again very much. Uh, I don't see any more questions. So with that, I will turn it back over to Joe.